Alright. Now I've finally got an Inventor 2017 here, so uh, I can start showing you exactly what you're going to do in the drawings. Uh, I just have uh, one uh, quick tip for you before we start off here. So if you go down to the start bar, and then you right click on the Inventor here, and then you choose this middle one, it will attach the Inventor one here, so it will be really easy to, to find it. So if I click this one, now if I close my Inventor, you see my inventor icon is still there. So now I have my correct inventor down here. I can just press that one. And I will start up the correct inventor, since you both have 2015 and 2017 on your computers. And your, your user will remember this on the different computers. So every time you start up a new computer, you will have to do this. But if you sit at the same computer most of the time, it's going to remember it for each time, if you've done this. So it's a nice way to, to, uh, to get it done. Our friends is there. <clears throat> so we'll see if uh, if the new inventor manages to find my project here, and it actually does. That's good. So we were doing practice task one, and we were had just started doing the drawings for it. So I'm going to activate. I'm activating my practice task one here since it has gone back to the the default uh, one, the uh, new installation. Yours is probably still on practice task one, but it might be wise to just check if it's uh, on that one. <coughs> then I'm clicking the, uh, the open one up there. So I'm going to try to find the plate IDW file. Then I do open on that one. And remember, if you, if you need any help, you have to really raise your hands just so that the student system manages to see them above the, uh, your screens. So. so now we have what we started off with. We managed to put the, the base view and the projected view in last time. So now we'll start looking at, uh, at uh, putting more dimensions on it, basically. So in order to put dimensions in place, we go up to the annotate tab up here. And then we have the general dimension that we're going to set in. So I've already put, put uh, two of the horizontal dimensions in, the length dimensions of the plate. So I'm going to put in the last one here also. Now there are two ways that I can do this. I can either put the last length here, or I can give the total length of the plate. In this case, it doesn't really matter what we do, so I'm going to put the last one up here. So I've clicked this line, and then I've clicked this line in order to get it, and I see that I have 60.00. I don't want that one, so I go up to the formatting, and I choose method 1B for it. Now as I've moved, as I've moved the dimension down there, it, Inventor wants to place it here. Inventor thinks this is a good location for it. But I want it to be in line with these other dimensions. So what I can do is move the mouse pointer on top of one of the other dimensions. Then I get this sort of yellow dot on my mouse pointer. And then I can place it, and it will automatically snap it into line with the other one. Press the OK button, because I'm not going to add any information to it. Now we can look at the fact that we have, we used the symmetry line when we created the model. So we mirrored, we mirrored the bottom part across the symmetry line which means that we can also use the symmetry line when we are doing the dimensions for this one. But first we have to show that there is symmetry on this part. And in order to show that, we're going to use, use the center line function up here. Because in, in the two dimensional drawings in Inventor, it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, 
make a difference if you if it's a center line or if it's a symmetry line. You just use the same same function for both. So I choose that one. I go over to the the tip here. And I hit that one. And then here on this side I can either choose choose the point in the middle or I can just choose the, the line itself and it's going to automatically put it in the center. But just to be on the safe side now, I'm going to have the green dot there, just to be completely sure that I'm hitting the center. The green dot means that I'm in, in the midpoint of the, uh, of the line. So put that one in there. And if I had wanted to now, I could have continued creating, uh, creating the line, especially if you have a circular pattern. It will make a straight line with the first two clicks and with the third click, it will create a, a circle. But we wanted to stop there. So we do the right mouse button. And then we choose create. Because if we don't do that, if we hit escape or something, it's just going to remove the entire line and we have to put it in once more. <clears throat> so now we can utilize the fact that we have a symmetry line here. So it tells us that this side is just the same as that side. So if I give a dimension from this line to the top line there, it knows that the center line will be directly in the middle. So I choose the top line <coughs> with regular dimension. Then I choose the bottom line. Yeah, as a time person as well. Again, I'm starting a new dimension, so I have to do the format one. Format method 1B. And I place it over to this side. Then I'll just let people catch up a bit. Looks like most of you have caught up, so I'm going to continue on a bit. If you remember it from uh, when we did the theory part, we usually want our dimensions to be below and to the, and to the right side of the item. But in this case, I'm putting this dimension on this side because I'm going to put the dimension over here on this side. 
So it would have been a bit, a lot of lines here, so it's a bit easier to read it if I'm putting one dimension to that side. So I'm going to use the same uh, same uh, method as I used on the previous one. I'm going to give the dimension across here. And I can give the entire length because the center line will be placed in the middle. So I use the dimension function. I choose the top line there. I go down to the bottom line, click that one. And again, I started a new dimension function. So now it's 0 0.00. I don't want that one. Up to format, switch to 1B. Evento wants to place it there, thinks that looks okay, and I agree with it, so I'm going to place it there. Press the OK button. So now we've got all of the length dimensions. It might be nice to put in the thickness of the plate also, just to, to ensure that we have the correct thickness here. And putting in the thickness is as easy as just clicking on the lower line here. However, as you can see, it's popping up with green dots. No, almost no matter where I put my mouse pointer. So in a case like this, you can either choose to use the, the sides from one side to the other, or you can just zoom in a bit. Because then the mouse pointer isn't going to automatically connect you to the midpoint or one of the endpoints. So then you get the, the line itself. You can zoom out before you set the, set the dimension into place. And again, I want, I want this dimension to be online with the other dimensions down here. So I move my mouse pointer over to the closest one, place it there. I get this little yellow dot uh, on my mouse pointer. So I move it over to the side here. And you see, as I move my mouse pointer closer and closer, I get these, this dotted line going to my yellow dot, which means that this dimension is in line with the other ones. So I'm placing it there. OK. So now we've gotten the thickness, we've gotten the length, we've gotten the width of the plate. So we have everything we need to create create uh, this part, the, the angled line here, because we know, we know that dimension and we know this dimension. We know the dimension over here, but we don't know the curves. So what are the radius of the curves? We need to put these on. <coughs> we still use the regular general dimension one. And now I haven't exited it, so I'm still in uh, method 1B in my format, so I can just uh, put it in here. So exactly which one, so this one was uh, R20, this one is R20, so that one is R20, and that one is R20. Okay. So exactly which one of those I choose to put uh, my R20 on doesn't really matter, so I'm just going to put it on this one. So I pull it out a bit so that I get this horizontal line. I place it there. And instead of putting R20 on every single one of those, getting a lot of dimensions in here, I'm going to enter some text up here now before I press the OK button. If you have already pressed the OK button, you can just click the dimension again, or if you have exited the dimension function completely, you double click the dimension. Then it will pop up into this window again. So here we have these, these grayed out symbols. They mean it's auto filling in the R20 there. So I give it one tap of the spacebar, and then I put in a parenthesis, and I write tip. This is to show that this exact dimension is the typical one, so that any, any such curves that haven't been given a dimension will have R20. This means that for these two, which are R10, we will have to give a dimension to both of those in order to distinguish them from the R20. So I'm still in the I'm still in the dimension function up there. So I still have the formatting method 1B on. 
So I press the top radius there. I place an R10 and then I do the lower one also. Make sure that you're not connecting it to, to the midpoint. That can screw up your uh, dimensioning a bit. If you have a problem getting it, uh, getting it without a green dot there, just zoom in like we did on the other one because then you have more, more line to move your pointer along. I pull it out here. I'll do this one once more because I just want to show something here. So dimension, method 1b. So now I've clicked the, now I'm putting the dimension back on there. So what we don't, we try to avoid having dimensions put inside uh, the drawing. So I don't want it to be inside my parts. If I can avoid that, that's good. If uh, your entire sheet is really filled up with a lot of dimensions and stuff, it's becoming really difficult to, to see what dimension is showing what, then sometimes you have to put dimensions inside. But so long as you can avoid it, you avoid it. So I'm going to pull it to the outside here. And this one is probably going to give me some trouble now. I'm going to put it in again. So there, now I can just zoom out to show everything. <clears throat> so now we have all of the dimensions we need in order to produce this plate. We have the width of the plate, we have all of the lengths, we know the radiuses that are going to be put in, and we know the thickness of the plate. So this is everything we need to produce the plate on a purely uh, cutting basis. So we know that we need a 10 millimeter thick plate, and we know where to place our cuts. But we don't know what surface we're going to have on this one. So then we have to check what it says in our, in our drawing or in our uh, compendium. So first off, there is also one more thing that we're missing. We don't know what material we're supposed to create this one from. So we're going to put in a, a table to show what material it is. What we are going to do now, basically, is we're going to do the parts list, which we usually use for assemblies. And then we're going to modify it so that it's only showing the information about the material. Because here we only have one part. We don't have several parts to show. So this means that we have to go up to the parts list part up here. It says actually it says table on this part of the toolbar. So we go up to the parts list. Then we will get one of these tables as we go along. But we only have one part, so it won't be as comprehensive as that one. We click the parts list one, and we get this window up. And the first thing it says in this window is select view. I think I'm just going to, to let people catch up a bit before I continue on. Okay, so we'll move on a bit. We've got this parts list window up now, and it wants me to, to select a view. 
it says up here, this one is marked in blue right now and it has a red mouse pointer. And we should know by now that if we have a red mouse pointer, we need to select something so that it turns white or else the, uh, nothing is going to happen. So what it basically wants us to do is to select the base view. It doesn't necessarily have to be the base view, we can also choose the projected view, but one of the views that we have on here. Because if you're creating very complicated uh, drawings, when you're an advanced user basically, you might have several different views in that are from different part files, or so different assembly files. And then uh, this one uh, needs to know which one are you going to choose as your parts list. So in our case, we only have one to choose from, so it, uh, it doesn't really matter. But we click on one of the views, and then we actually see that it's filled in here. So it's filled in the H location, lecture, practice task one, plate.ipt. So now it's, it's selected our part file, and it's going to use that one as a basis for the uh, parts list. The rest of this one is for very advanced users, so we're not going to, to look at those. If we just continue on without touching the other uh, parts of this window, uh, it's going to be all fine. We're going to create a, a perfect parts list. But uh, these are more for very advanced users to customize uh, the lists as you put it in. So we press OK. And now I've got this triangle following my mouse pointer around. No, tri <laughs> this rectangle following my mouse pointer around. Now I'm going to place it down in this corner. It doesn't, doesn't matter if it's uh, touching my dimensions right now. That's not a problem. It's going to, it's going to end up uh, as a smaller rectangle uh, as we go along. So I'm placing it in here. And now we see we have a bit too much uh, information here. Actually, we don't have the information we want at all. Because it's telling me the item number. This is the first item in this uh, part. It's the only item also. It's one in quantity, so we only have one of them. It's named plate, and I haven't filled in any uh, information for description. But it doesn't say anything about the parts, uh, about the material of the part here. So I need to do something about it. So I keep it marked red like this by holding my mouse pointer on top of it. I double click, and I'm opening up this window. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the title here, which says parts list. Yeah, I'm just gonna work out. Okay. That work. So then I go up here to table layout. I click that one. And we see that I have a checkbox with the title. So if I uncheck that one, it's going to remove the parts list uh, title from the, from the table. So when I press OK now, We've done with that. It doesn't update uh, this parts list until I press the apply button. But we're going to do something more here. So we're going up to up to this one, column chooser. I press that one. And here are the different columns of the table. And as you can see, I have item, quantity, part number, and description. Those are already chosen for my table. I don't want any of those in there. So I'm going to mark one of them, click remove. And I'm going to remove the next one, and remove the third, and remove the fourth. I don't need any of those in this case. But I do want it to show the material of the part. So now I have to go into the available properties, and I have to find the one that says material. So I go down a bit, and there I see there's a column named material. I can add that one. So I add it into here, so only material is selected. Then I press the OK button. And now if I press the Apply button, it's going to update my parts list. So Apply, and now it says Material, Aluminium, 6061. So now I've got the information I need to select the correct plate. Press the OK button to exit. And just, just in order to make this look a bit, uh, bit better, because now it's using 
uh, a line change on the aluminium because the column is, is too narrow. So I'm just going to pull the column a little bit wider. So I mark it with red by clicking on it once. Then I go to the side there and it acts just like any other spreadsheet table. I can pull on the column width. There. I pulled it wide enough to get everything in one line. But now you see, instead of moving everything down, it's moved it up. So then I need to move my, my own table. I drag and drop it down into the corner again.
Right, um, we need to add even more information before this one can be actually produced. So now we know, we put in the information about the material of the plate, we know the thickness of the plate, and we know the pattern it needs to be cut in. But we don't know anything about the surface, so we need to, to add the uh, surface information. And we also need to add uh, the general tolerances. So we'll do the general tolerances first, and then we'll do the, the general surface information. So <coughs> the general tolerances is basically that we're just going to put in some text on top of here, which tells which ISO standard you're going to follow, and if it's medium or fine or coarse, uh, that it's going to be followed. So we're going to put this information in here. Uh, and the way to do that is to just choose the text function. And the text function, the function will create just text. They won't put it in a box like the uh, material table uh, is put in. It will just create text so that we can move it around afterwards and anything. So we place it approximately in the correct location. We can move it easily afterwards. So if you, if you placed it up here, uh, it doesn't really matter because we'll just move it after we've put in the text. I'll just uh, wait a bit for people to catch up. Thank you. 
So we'll put in the note about the general tolerances and the surface roughness. Uh, and then we're closing in on the break, I think. So uh, what we need here, so we'll have to check our compendium for, for the information. So we're going to add the text general tolerance and surface finish, like this. Then we press the enter button to get the new line there. The tolerance standard that we're going to use is the ISO 27681. And for this one, we're just going to use the medium tolerances, which is a very, very usual one. Uh, basically, the normal one, unless you have. Uh, specific needs in your production. So, unless you have something uh, very specific for your tolerances that it needs to be extra fine or you can allow it to be very, very coarse, then you use the medium one usually. So, we put in a small M, lowercase m. Then we enter ISO 2768 2. And we'll use a capital K for that one, which is the equivalent to the medium one. This one gives tolerances for length dimensions, while this one gives more tolerances to, to uh, perpendicularity, uh, straightness, parallel, that things are parallel and stuff like that. So, so it's, uh, it is necessary to actually give both of them. Most, most production facilities will, if you have only given one of them, they will assume the one that's equal for the other one. So especially if you need, need a finer tolerance there and you're using a medium there, then it's especially, uh, especially important to, to give both. Now we've gotten the information that we need in this box. So we'll press the OK button. It's still there, the text, if you didn't get it. You also have it in your book. <laughs> uh, page 187 in your book. That's where all the text is. What? I have a question for, for this. Or Oh, uh, yeah, you'll have to wait for the break. We're not done uh, yet. <coughs> so now we can see it's, it's a bit too high up. I want it to be uh, closer to this line. So I'm going to mark it. I'll just click on it once so that it turns red. And then I can uh, just drag and drop, move it down here. Now it's closer to the closer to the line. Looks a bit a bit better. So before we do a break, we're also going to put in the general surface finish, and then we need to go up to the symbols part up here. Just going to remove it. The symbols, and here we have the surface texture symbols. So we click this one. And as you can see above my mouse pointer here, there is sort of a, a looks like a check mark. 
I'm going to move it down to, to the title border here. I'm going to click once on the left mouse button, and then I'm going to click once on the right mouse button afterwards, and choose continue. So left mouse button first, then right mouse button, and continue. Then I get this window up, and we're going to put in, let's see, we're going to put in uh, RZ50. So we go down to the C field here. That's where we are putting in the, the uh, surface finish dimension. And for this one, we're going to use RZ. So a capital R and a lowercase z. And we'll put in 50. Just means that we will, we will tolerate quite a rough surface on this one. So it can be, be roughly cut. <coughs> and we want to choose, shouldn't have a, we want to choose the middle option here on the surface type. And if I put my mouse pointer above it, it says removal of material required. So it means that they have to, they have to uh, manufacture this surface. So that they have to do something with it. And I'll put in OK. <clears throat> and this, this general surface finish will count for the cut edge along the entire plate there. But uh, I don't want I don't want this uh, requirement to be for for the flat surface of the plate. So so for this side of the plate, for the top and the bottom of the plate, it's not going to be necessary to do anything with those. I don't want them to to put them through a milling machine or anything to to get a certain surface. So I'm going to put a symbol on this side. So first the left mouse button then the right mouse button and continue because then it sort of snaps to, to the line and what I'm going to do this time is choose the third option on surface type which says that removal of material is prohibited so this means that they are going to not do anything with that surface so they're just going to let it be as it is and then I do the same on the other side I mark the line, left mouse button, right mouse button, continue. And I choose removal of material prohibited. And OK. So now I'm telling them that the plate that they have bought, they're only going to cut it. They're not going to treat the, uh, the flat surfaces of it. They're only going to cut it. And now we only have the title block left. And I think we're, we're going to finish off the title bug also before we do a break. And then we'll do a 15 minute break afterwards. <coughs> so when you're done doing the surface uh, symbol, you either click the escape button or right click and uh, use the exit option. And now we're going to, to fix the information inside the title box. So we're going to... <coughs> We're going to go into the, uh, the tree here, where we have the uh, different parts of the drawing listed. And you see the, the ISO one. If this one is open, if it isn't open, you just click this arrow. You want to go down to the one that's named Field Text. We're going to edit that one. So you mark it, then you right click it, and you choose Edit Field Text. It is not possible to, to enter values directly in here, so we have to click on the symbol up there, which says I properties. Then we open up a new window. And just to make it a bit easier to relate what information you're actually putting in here, I would recommend moving this window to the side here, so that you have them uh, side by side because you're going to look for these property fields in the different tabs of this one 
and then you're going to add information. So if we, we can see there, is, there isn't anything to add here, everything is filled in. So we go to the summary tab instead, and here we have quite a bit. The top one is named title, and we also have title there. So we want to do something for this one. So I'm going to put in plate there. <clears throat> we can also see that we have an author field, and we also have an author field here. And in your cases, I want you to use your student number when you are filling those in, especially for your submissions, because I'll be correcting them based on student numbers and not on names or abbreviations. So it's important to have the student number there. So in my case, I have that student number. And if you keep looking through these, we have subject, manager, company. Well, company, that one is, uh, is in here. So we can put something in company. And then you can either put in a uh, fictitious company that you are creating yourself. Maybe it's a, your, uh, your fantasy company that you're working for, anything. Or you can just put in HSH for, for the school. So uh, it's up to you what you want to put in on company there. Maybe you want to work for ABLE, so you put in ABLE there or something, so just to impress. We continue on to the next tab, which is named Project. Here we see we have part number. It is already filled in with plate because that's the name of the part file that we have. So it's pre-filled in and we see that it is also filled in there. So we don't need to do anything with part number. <coughs> we need to do something with revision number, however. Revision number is not shown here in this one, but it's a bit further down. So revision number is Usually, a revision number is alphabetical, so A, B, C. So the first version of this drawing will be A. And then if we do some changes to it, we have to give it a new revision number, so then it will be B. So I'm just going to put in A in this case. Some companies operate with 0, 1, 0, 2, uh, like that. So it's uh, dependent on company, really. <coughs> then none of the rest that are on this side are shown in the title field so we continue on to the status tab and here we will find some because we have we have checked by which is also shown here checked by and we have engineer approved by so we have to fill in those two so in this case i'm just going to put in tobion as my checker and I'm going to put in A now as my approver. And then we also just check the dates, because I can't quite remember which of them. I think it's the approval one that uses a date. And then when we're done filling in here, we press the uh, use button, or apply, or whatever it's uh, called. And then uh, when we click the close button, this one will update. Now you see I have, I've got my, uh, my student number as the author, and I have Tobion checking and Einar approving. So I click OK, and we have all of the information put into here. We have my student number down here, we have Tobion checking, we have Einar approving, we have the creation date, we also have the approval date, we have the name, we have the company, we have the revision, and we have the uh, number of sheets. So now we are missing one more thing before this drawing is completely finished. We're going to do one more text box. I go up to text up there. And this one can be placed almost wherever you want, so I'm going to place it somewhere down here. And I'm going to name this one Notes. 
because this is where you will give any special notes to, to the production uh, uh, facility. Such as if you, if you want them to use a, a laser cutter instead of a water jet, you can specify it. You can write specifically what they're going to do down here. The only thing that we are going to uh, specify here, we have one note, so note number one. It is that they are going to break sharp edges and they're going to break them with 0 0.2 times 45. And then we have over here, we have a degree symbol. So we can, can click that one with the, uh, with the mouse pointer and we get a degree symbol in here. So they're going to break sharp edges with 0 0.2 millimeters at a 45 degree angle. So they're basically going to chamfer all of the edges, which just means that they are grinding them a bit after they've after they've cut the plates, so that they, and there's no sharp edges that you can uh, cut yourself on if you're handling the plates. Click the OK button. And now my note is a bit, a bit uh, off on the placement, so I'm going to going to move it a bit down into the corner there. So if you're using this corner or that corner or up there or something, it uh, really doesn't matter where you put the note so long as it's clearly visible. Usually a company will have specific rules as to where you are putting general tolerances and notes and everything else there. <coughs> the last thing we'll do is to press the save button. We should have done that more often just in case it meant a crash, which it sometimes does. So you just click past all of the uh, information boxes there and now it's saved the drawing. So then we'll do a 15 minute break. Right, it's uh, about time we start with practice task two. So I've just closed down my drawing. Now I have to create a new project. So I go up to the projects button. Now I'm in the practice task one. As you can see with the with the B group, I actually managed to do one and two. I didn't finish completely with uh, practice task two, but they haven't done any of the drawings at all. They haven't started the drawings because I was on. We got the problems with 2015 uh, version here last time. So then we just figured out with the B group. We'll just do the the uh, 3D models last week, and then we'll do the drawings this week. So. So that even, even though it looks like they're ahead of you, they're not ahead of you because they haven't done the drawing for task one. <clears throat> so now we're going to do uh, a new task. And we'll do the single user project. I'll call it practice task 2A, just so I can uh, keep ahead of myself here. Oops, uh, I forgot something. I, of course, have to choose the correct path for it. I go to the my computer, and I choose the H server. And then in my case, I choose the my lecture folder, and I'm going to create a new, new folder in there. So I'm going to call it practice task 2A. And then again, the problem with it is not actually choosing the new folder I've, uh, I've created. So I have to click a bit back and forth here. So I wanted to go to 2A. So now it says practice task 2A here. So press OK there. Then I do the finish. And I got my practice task 2A with the check mark beside it. So that's the active project right now. And I press the done button. So for this one, we're also going to create a plate, but now we're going to also use some other functions than just uh, creating a sketch and extruding the plate. We're also going to create holes afterwards. So I go up to the new button there, and I have to choose the, the metric folder so that I can get the correct correct file type. And I want the standard in millimeters. 
standard millimeters dot ipt create so now i in now i'm inside the new part that we've created so i'm going to start off with a sketch again we have I actually forgot to bring the uh, I forgot to bring the model this time but for this one we have a a symmetry line that's going a vertical symmetry line along the plate so we're going to utilize that when we are modeling it so we're going to do a new 2d sketch and again, my preference is to place it on the horizontal plane here. So I'm going to select the horizontal plane with my new 2D sketch. And now it's flipped my top view. So it's flipped 90 degrees. So I'm going to just flip it back. Go up to this, this curved arrow up there. Press that one. And it's flipping the top view to be, be the correct way up. Which is a bit easier to uh, to navigate them. <clears throat> the first thing I'll do is to create the uh, symmetry line again. So I go to the construction line part. I mark this one so that it becomes blue. So now the construction line is active. So any line that I'm putting out now into the 2D drawing will be a construction line. It won't be a part of the uh, the uh, sketch itself, basically. So I create a new line. And for this one, for the first task, we we used a lot of, we forced Inventor to not use its automatic functions. So we wanted to put a lot of the constraints in place ourselves. But now we're going to allow Inventor to suggest automatic constraints, and then we're going to choose them from there. So in this case, I want it to be, be vertical, and go through the uh, center point of my coordinate system. So I'm moving my mouse pointer below here. And it's a bit difficult to see now, but it's probably easier on the screen if you get it. You can see that there are, is a dotted line going up to the center, which means that it is exactly below it. So I press my mouse button there, and I drag it upwards. And now that I've placed my mouse pointer directly above the center point, we can see that it's, it's showing one of the auto-constraint symbols here, or one of the constraint symbols. It's the same one as you can find up there in constraints. It's the middle one all over to the right, which is the vertical constraint. So it's constraining it to become completely vertical. And if I move my mouse pointer to the side here, that symbol disappears. And then it's making uh, the line at an angle, but I want it to automatically place this vertical constraint in there so that I don't have to do it manually afterwards. So if I just push my mouse button now, then this one is locked in to being a vertical line. I don't want to create more lines right now. So I exit the line function. And I definitely don't want to create more construction lines, so I'm going to remove the marking on the construction line function remove that one so now it's not blue anymore there is one more thing that I want to do with the symmetry line before I uh, before I start uh, creating the regular lines I want the center point of the line itself to be locked on to the center point of the uh, uh, coordinate system so I choose this coincident constraint which locks one point to another I put my mouse pointer onto the symmetry line so that it turns white. Then I move it downwards. And what I'm looking for is the green dot. There is the green dot. So it was almost in the middle already. It also says middle point if I just let it hover there for a while. So I press the middle point. That's the middle point of the line. And then I move to the origo, the center of the uh, coordinate system. And I press that one also. So now the line has been moved onto the origo. I uh, press OK there, so I exit the coincident constraint. 
So now we're going to do more lines up here. Make sure that you've, you've removed the construction line option before you start creating more lines. So we'll start off with the bottom of the plate. So I'm setting, attaching it here. And I'm going to move it over to the side here. As long as I keep it at an angle, you can see that it's not doing anything uh, in particular to it. But if I move it more down to a horizontal position, then Inventor basically telling me, I'm going to put this as a horizontal constraint because it looks like you want it to be horizontal. And we want that, so we're going to, uh, we're going to choose that one. But we also want it to be a specific length. So now we're going to manipulate length here. So the, the total width of the plate is supposed to be 210 millimeters. But we're doing one, one side of the uh, plate right now. So we need half. So we write in 210. And then we divide by 2. And then, then you can see here, if I just put in the divisor line, it turns red, which means that it's not going to do anything until you, uh, until you finish it. So divide by 2. Now it's black again, so now it uh, now it can actually perform the calculation. If I now press the enter button, I get a horizontal line that is exactly 105 millimeters. <clears throat> and it wants me to continue with the next line, which is uh, all fine by me. But I don't want it to continue on horizontally. I want it to go straight up. So I move my line upwards. Until I get to this point, now when Mentor says that if you want to place the line here, it looks like you want it to be at a 90 degree angle from the previous line. That's what we want. Some of you might get it uh, telling you that it wants to put it as a vertical line. That's not a problem either. It will do, do the same effect in this case. And for this line, we want it to be 110 millimeters. And now we want the full length. So we Press in, 110. We press the enter button. And then it finishes this line up here. And now we're going to have a, an angle line up here. This one is a bit more difficult to, to set correct. We will need to manually lock this into place afterwards. So we're just going to put a random line at an angle up here. So we'll put it up like this. The next line, we want to go horizontally again. And as you can see, it's not giving me the horizontal symbol here, but it's giving me a parallel. And it's showing a black line on top of this. So it's telling me that I'm going to put it parallel to that line. And that's OK. We wanted to do that. And we also want a specific length of this line. The length of this line is supposed to be 40 millimeters. So we put in 40. Press the enter button. So then we've already locked this one in to be parallel with this one and 40. So the only thing that's going to change here is when we lock this one into place, it's going to move a little bit, but that's okay. The next line is going downwards because now we have the slot up on the top of the plate. And here it's, Inventor wants to put it at a 90 degree angle from the previous line. That is okay. It could also have said parallel to this one or parallel to the symmetry line or just work vertical. Any one of those options is completely okay to use. And this one is supposed to be 30 millimeters. So I put in 30 millimeters, press enter. And now the last line will go horizontal and over to the, the, um, uh, the, the symmetry line. And it's supposed to be, so I'm just going to pull it over here. And we see that inventor wants to do it at a 90 degree angle from the previous line. Completely okay. And the width of the slot up here is supposed to be 30 millimeters, but that's across the symmetry line. So we need half. So 30 divided by 2. 
We press enter. And now we're done creating new lines. So we can either use the right mouse button and click OK or use the escape button on the on the keyboard. Just zoom in a bit here to, to see it a bit better. So we can see here, I'm not connected to the symmetry line up top, so I'm going to have to do that manually. In order to connect it, I use the coincidence constraint. I mark the end point of this top line. And then I mark the symmetry line itself. Once I hit this one, it is moved over here. Exit the coincident constraint function. Now we need to lock this, this line into place. And in order to lock it into place, we are going to uh, use the dimension function here. So general dimension. And from the drawing on the first page of this practice task, it says that from this point and up to this line here, so this distance here, is going to be 20 millimeters. So then I put the dimension there on the end point of this line, and I choose the top line there. I pull my mouse pointer over here to make sure I get the vertical one. Place it. And then I write in 20 and enter. So now it's placed in the correct height there. <coughs> the reason why these, this bottom line and the top lines and this line are green is because they're not completely locked into place yet. And that's because I can, at this point, pull my entire drawing up and down along the symmetry line. So it's not locked to the center point yet. So what I'm going to do is pull it a bit further down here. So I have the, the top of my center line is up here. And I'm going to use the coincident constraint. And I'm going to put it on the top of the symmetry line. and then on the top line of the plate itself. So now those are locked into place. And what we can see is that all of my lines have turned dark blue. And down in the corner here, it says fully constrained. So we know that none of this is going to move unless I physically change any of the dimensions. So I exit the constraint there. And now we're going to mirror it across the, the uh, symmetry line. So we're going to use the mirror function. And first off, we have to select the lines that we are going to mirror. And then we have to select the symmetry line as the mirror line afterwards. So I'm going to use the drag and drop option here. But make sure that when you're doing the drag and drop, make sure that you're not covering the symmetry line. So put it over here. And now you can see that these are marked with a bright blue, while these are still dark blue. So I have to choose those manually, because they weren't completely covered by my selection box. Now I have to choose the symmetry line as my mirror line. And then, this is one of the functions in, in Mentor where you have to click apply instead of going directly for done. So I click apply, and it does the drawing over on the side here. And we press done. Can zoom out a bit so that we can see the entire plate. So now we've created the outline of the plate. I'm 
just going to let people catch up a bit before we extrude it. The next step then is to finish our sketch and we're going to extrude it to the correct thickness. So we do finish sketch, and then it sort of zooms in here and we can't see anything. So we're going to, to use the zoom out function, zoom all, so that we get to see everything from our sketch here. Then we go over for the extrude option up here. We click it, and since we only had one uh, one thing drawn in our sketch, it will automatically choose that one. It didn't have several uh, uh, several outlines to choose from; it only had one, so it goes automatically for that one. But we're only supposed to have a five millimeter plate now, not a ten millimeter. So we need to change change the thickness of the plate down to five. We press enter. So now we have a five millimeter plate with the correct outline. And just to, just to make it a bit easier to, uh, to look at the plate when we are going to create our holes, I'm going to flip it to the top side and then flip it over to the side like this. Now I'm looking at it from the top. And I'll just zoom it in a bit to, uh, to get a better view. <coughs> Thank you. 
Now we'll start creating holes in this plate. So we're supposed to create uh, eight holes. We'll actually be using the mirror function out here also. So we'll, we'll be creating four holes on one side and then we'll be mirroring them over to the other side. <coughs> and in order to do this, we are going to use the fabulously named function of hole. So it basically tells you exactly what you're going to do. You're going to create holes with it. <clears throat> what you can do beforehand, if you want to, is to create a two-dimensional sketch on top of your part and place points exactly where the centers of the holes are supposed to be. Or we can use the function directly like this. The, the different placement parts here is, here you have the, the top one is from sketch which is if you already have drawn a sketch to place your holes. You can use the linear one, which is the one we are going to use this one, on this one. You also have concentric, uh, which means that it will place it uh, on an axis of another uh, circular uh, feature. Or if you have placed a point directly, we're not going to use that one uh, at all. But we're going to use concentric and linear. Uh, I can't remember if we're going to use from sketch on any of them, but that one is also pretty easy to use. So in this case, we're going to use linear because we have the dimensions between all of the holes. So the first thing it asks us to do is select the face, and that is the surface that we want to, to work from. 
So we want to work from this surface, this face of the of the 3D part. I'm going to tilt the part a bit just to be able to show it a bit better. <coughs> the second thing it wants us uh, to put is a reference. And then we're going to choose choose a line as the reference. So I'm choosing the bottom part of the plate right now as the first reference. And then it wants me to put in a dimension here. So the height from the bottom part of the plate and up to the center of the first hole is given to be 20 millimeters. So I'm putting in 20 there. Oops, I wasn't supposed to do that. Linear face on that one. And then 20 there. Uh, you, you must not press the enter button or anything here. You just choose the next reference. So you see this one has turned blue now. So now it wants us to choose the, the second reference. And then we'll just do, do the outer edge of the plate. And I have to give the distance from this edge and to the center of, of the first hole. And that distance is also 20. So I'm putting in 20 there also. So now it's moved it into the corner here, this hole. Now I need to give information about the hole itself. So we have a couple of uh, different options up here. Those that are up here. And basically it is a straight hole, which is the top one. And then it is one with a counter bore, which means that the start diameter of the hole is bigger than the rest of the hole. So that you could, for an example, fit, uh, uh, fit the, the head of a bolt into the top of the hole and then uh, the rest of the bolt going further down. Uh, the same uh, for the next one, it's called a spot face, which is if you have a curved surface, you will do the same where you will create a wider dimension hole at the top just to get a, a smooth surface for, for the head of the bolt to lie against. And then you have the countersunk option, which is if you have uh, a bolt head which is, uh, has a 90 degree angle uh, on it, so that it, is, it is, uh, has angled sides. We're just creating regular holes, so we're choosing one up top. We're also going to use uh, the termination here, which says through all, because that means it's going all the way through the plate. If, if this was a hole that was supposed to just go two millimeters into the plate, we would have chosen, chosen distance and then set, uh, set how deep it was going to be. But this one is going through the entire plate. And then we have the diameter of the hole. And the diameter is set to, well, actually, in the first drawing you have in your practice task, it says a radius of 10. So what we can do is do 10 multiplied with 2. In this case, we could have just written 20. It would have been easy. But if you want to be completely on the safe side, you can do the uh, put in the uh, uh, equation instead. And then we press the apply button. So now we've gotten the first hole here. But we want four holes on this side, and we want four holes on this side. So now we're going to use a pattern to replicate this first hole. So we're going to go to the, the uh, pattern part of the toolbar up here. And we'll choose the rectangular pattern so that we can basically set it up with uh, a certain amount of holes with certain distances between them. So we choose this one. The first thing it wants us to do is to choose a feature. And that feature is the hole itself. So you can either mark the hole like this, or you can go over to the, the browser tree over here and mark the hole there. Depends a bit on what is the easiest way of uh, marking it. If, if it's a very small feature, it can be difficult to mark it uh, in, the, in the model itself, so it might be easier to doing it in the browser tree. But we want to mark this hole, which we just created. And now it wants us to give a couple of directions. So direction one, 
I'm going to put it on the along the uh, lower part of the lower edge of the uh, plate. And now we put put an arrow this way. So I want to place a new hole right beside there. That's because I only have 10 millimeters of distance between them. So I want to have some more distance. So I look at my drawing here, and it says I'm supposed to have 50 millimeters between them. So I'll go up to the distance here. And I'll put in 50. And you can see it has moved the hole over here. But we want two more holes. We want two holes up here also. So now we're going to give a second direction. And we'll choose the, the vertical side of the uh, plate. And now it wants us, it's, it has given us the direction of downwards. But we don't want that. So we'll go to, to this symbol beside it, which says flip. Because then we will flip the direction. So now it's pointing upwards instead. So that's the way we want it to go. And we have the spacing here which says 70. Put in 70 there. And then we can see the outlines of our holes. They seem to be placed in the correct positions according to the drawing that we're creating this from. So then I press the OK button. And now let's copy it out the first hole we created and placed it in uh, three more positions. Now we want to do all of these four holes and mirror them over to this side. Just as we do in the sketch when we are mirroring lines across the symmetry line, we can do the same with three-dimensional features. So again, we go up to the pattern part of the toolbar up there, and we have a fairly similar symbol as what's in the sketch, a mirror symbol there. We click that one. It wants us to select our features. And what we can do now is uh, uh, choose either, I'm not sure if it's going to do this correctly. It's a bit easier to do it here. If I choose the original hole, it's going to mirror only that hole. But if I choose the rectangular pattern, it usually wants to do all of them. So if I move it over here, as you can see here, it's marking all, all four holes. And we can also see in the browser tree now that both hole one and the rectangular pattern has become blue. And now we need, instead of a mirror line, we need a mirror plane. So we're going to, to mirror it across the plane. Just going to mark this one so that I can choose a plane. But I don't have any planes to, to look at here. It is possible to choose, uh, for an example, an edge like this one. So I can choose this edge and mirror it across that edge, but this edge isn't in the center of my plate, and I want to mirror it across the center. But since I have located my sketch directly onto the center of the coordinate system, I can use the YZ plane, because that one is going straight through my plate here. So I need to go over to the browser, browser tree here, where I see the origin folder. I open up the origin folder, and here you can see I have three planes and I have three axes. And all of them are grayed. Uh, the, the icon for each of them is grayed out. And that's why you can't see them, because they have been made invisible uh, in my part here. But if I hover my mouse across them, it's going to show them inside my uh, 3D parts. So in this case, I got the correct one uh, right away, the YZ plane, which is going straight through there. But I can just show the other ones. Here is the XZ plane, which is the one I used to, to create the original sketch on. And we have the XY plane that goes through here. But we want to mirror it across to this side, so we need to have the top one. The YZ plane, which didn't want to show for some reason. There. We want to mirror it across this one. It goes straight through the center of our uh, plate. So we choose that one. And then it does the outline of the holes on the other side. So we can check that this is correct. We press OK. And then we have all eight holes in our plate. But we only used 
we only created one hole specifically, and we have used patterns to, to recreate the rest of the holes. And for, for this part, it would most likely not really matter much if you created all eight holes individually, or if you created one and then used, used these two pattern types on them. But when you are getting into large plates, maybe you are going to put in 80 holes in a plate, then these pattern functions are perfect to use. It's going to save you a lot of time uh, to learn to use these. So then we're done for today. We won't get the chance to start on the drawing for this one, but we'll do that next week.